All right, hey you and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old podcast, yep, hitting you with a fresh one, folks. Today, I've got for you two stories. It's a twofer, and both of these stories are based around the same team. Yep, same team, pretty much. I mean, it's really about when love goes bad, Boohoo! And one of them sees red. One of the people in that relationship sees red. Um, well, actually, I, I suppose kind of sees a lot of red. Uh, buckets of it. In fact, definitely in one of these ones. In both of these stories, the perp, the scumbag, to quote cop shows, is the lady in the relationship. And in both, accusations were flying. They're flying, lads, left, right, and center. About. Listen to this, Buckaroos. The accusations were that he had it coming. Should have been done a long time ago, if you ask me. Though, spoiler alert, in the first story, I don't think anyone deserves what happened to them. And in the second story, uh, well, uh, no spoilers for that, so I just disregard what I just said. You know me. Before we get into it, my friends, please, if you could subscribe, follow, leave a review, leave a rating for this old podcast wherever you get your podcasts. I promise if you do, if it's a lovely one, I will crawl out of your speaker, I will crawl out of your earphones to give you a nice little pat on your head. Or I suppose I can just give you a verbal thank you if you'd prefer. Thank you. Now, let's give it a go. So this first story, um, it's kind of a uh, whew, uh, odd one um, to, to kind of put it mildly. See, you know, we see the typical murder weapons of guns, of knives, you know, poisons, hammers, axes, you get it, right? The usual kind of uh, the default weapons. But in this one, the weapon of choice, or well, I suppose really weapon of convenience rather, was a fancy schmancy blue stiletto heel. Yes, that's correct. A stiletto heel. You know, I've always said every person around you wearing high heels, they may as well be strapping an AR-15. And once again, I feel vindicated. A typical, you know, female murderer. It's it's different from a male murderer. They tend to have like patterns. Um, the female murderers, they typically are related or know their victims, and they usually kill in self-defense or you know maybe due to mental illness. Whereas, I, you know, a lot of times men are just more like, um, you know, the male killers are just, you know, ah, sure, fuck it. They're also, they're more likely to use a weapon other than a gun. And so in this one, the shoe fit. So our lady in this old case is one Anna Trujillo. Born on February 25th, 1969, nice, in Mexico, she was a mother of two, a divorcee, and according to many, promiscuous often jumping from man to man. Very nice. After the failure of her second marriage, she left her children with their stepfather and she happily moved on to, you know, the cougar single lifestyle. You know, fuck yeah, dude. She was described as flirty. You know, she loved to party. And the more attention from men, the better. A very, um, a very healthy mindset. If by very healthy mindset, you mean midlife crisis, if you ask me. She had moved to Houston, Texas in 2009, where she continued her fishing of men, where they would happily pay for her rent and for, um, you know, other things, winkity wink. Uh, by that I mean, you know, winkity wink means her time and nothing else, lawmen. She did, however, previously work as an executive for Coca-Cola, and in more recent years, which is the time of our story, she worked as a masseuse but ain't no happy ending in our story, I'm afraid. Anna, 45 at the time, was living in an upscale high-rise apartment in 2013 with another man when she ran into our victim. The next boy toy, you know, she was going through them like they were Skittles. And that was Dr. Alf Stefan Anderson, who was 59 years of age. Anderson was a professor with the University of Houston's Biology and Biochemistry Department. Now, Sparks must have flown when, you know, she accepted an offer to go out for a drink the same night they bumped into each other. And then just, just weeks later, she moved into his upscale high-rise on the 18th floor. So she dumped 
the guy she had been living with and quite literally moved up in the world. Their romance now, uh, spoiler alert, it wouldn't, it wouldn't survive long when, just a couple of months later, in June 2013, Anna would stab Stefan 25 times in the face, yikes, that'll uh, leave a mark, with her 5 inch stiletto heels, a gift from Anderson. She would claim, you know, self-defense, whereas anybody with half a brain would say it's clearly murder. Alf Stefan Anderson was born May 11th, 1959 in Sweden. He was one of three children, being the only boy. He would move to Texas in the 1980s to pursue a career in medical research and eventually went on to his role in the 1990s at the University of Houston. During his, his you know, medical research, he was able to contribute to developing treatments for prostate cancer and male pattern baldness with the pharmaceutical company Merck. Now, Anderson, uh, he, he struggled with alcoholism, but friends say, you know, he had battled it, he had taken it into the ring, he had bait the shite out of it, and he had won. At the time of his death, he was grand. It was a non-issue. He would still like the occasional drink, but he had, he had self-control. He was able to, to manage it. He, he could go out for, you know, a glass of wine now and then, and he was able to stop himself after a couple. His obituary stated that not only was he a highly intelligent man, I mean, goddamn, he worked at the University of Houston, but he was selfless, uh, giving, and he had a great sense of humor. I guess that's why he ended up with Anna. He also had been previously married to a Jackie Swift, divorcing in 1995 after just five years of marriage. Now, Stefan, he lived in the elite Park Lane Apartments in the Museum District in Houston. It provided personal, personal concierge services, valet, a park on the third floor with a tennis court, pool with private cabanas, and a gym. Can I, let me the fuck in, seriously. In the early morning hours of June 9th, 2013, a 911 call was placed by our dear, dear Anna Trujillo. A lot, uh, you know, a lot of what she said and her emotions in that call seemed a bit put on, with her end, you know, mostly coming out as uh, gibberish, I guess you could say. Something about he attacked her and he was almost about to die. Why you need a medical place of fire? Okay, ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Hello? Give it up. Now, when the responding officer arrived, all he had to go on was uh, that, you know, whatever happened, happened in apartment number 18. However, what, uh, what was confusing for the first responders was that in this particular building, all the apartments were listed by the floor number, follow, followed by a letter. So on the fourth floor, for example, all apartments were 4, 4A, 4B, 4C and so on. So when, you know, the responding officer arrived, he had no idea if it was apartment 18F or apartment 18A until he, he got onto the corridor and he started just walking slowly, putting his little ear, you know, next to the doors, listening for any distress or sounds, of, you know, it to indicate, yep, that sounds like, you know, what the, they were calling the police for. He heard crying coming from apartment 18B upon knocking and announcing it was the police, Anna, covered in blood, opened the door. The officer would later go on to say that Anna had blood on her forehead and her cheeks, her hands and her clothes. The crotch area of her jeans was also soaked. Anna said he attacked her and she acted in self in self-defense. When asked what weapon she had used, she said she had grabbed the closest thing to her in the heat of the moment. Her five and a half inch stiletto Heel. That's, you may as well just grabbed a fucking butcher knife. When checking Anderson for any signs of life, he noticed the shoe lying nearby, covered in blood and matted with hair. Now, Anna mentioned that she had tried to revive him once she realized, um, I think he might be dead. Probably should have tried to maybe revive him earlier. However, uh, it kind of appeared that that wasn't the case. I mean, she used the stiletto heel on his face yet her mouth and the, you know, the area around her mouth, uh, it should have been covered with blood. It wasn't. Also at the scene was a tarot book with the death card open. Oh, shit, lads. Testimony would show that Anna, she was interested in the occult, in witchcraft, 
in black magic. To what degree is unknown, but my folks, you know what that means. Satanic black magic. Sick shit. Stilettos haunted. Once taken to the station for questioning, Anna's story of events, and even, you know, the way she described Anderson's personality, um, well, the way she described them were very, very different to many who knew them, family and friends. According to Anna, she and Stefan went out that night, you know, together to celebrate their recent engagement, after being together literally a handful of months. This crazy bitch had enough of the masseusing and was ready to settle down. <laughs> again, till something better came along. When they got home, fueled by alcohol and jealousy, he attacked her. Dr. Dr. Stefan become Dr. Evil Stefan. Now, the actual cause of the fight isn't clear. One version of events stated that Stefan saw Anna's suitcases by the door and he immediately, just like boom, assumed she was leaving him. Now, she was packed up to travel to Waco to visit her daughters. But he attacked saying, you know, she was never going to leave him. I'm not letting you out of here alive. Other stories said, you know, he attacked her because Anna was too flirtatious at the bar. She was like showing a little bit of nipple to your patrons. I don't know if she was. He threw her against the wall. They wrestled and they toppled over a couch. Now, Anna said she, she ripped out handfuls of his hair. There was no blood in those clumps of hair, confirming, you know, that she did rip out his hair before the shoe got involved. Push me, he hit me against the wall, and I cried. I begged him. I, I tried everything. And he took me, and he slammed me. Anna then said Stefan was pulling at her leg as she was trying to get away. And then, using whatever she had, she grabbed her shoe and swung it behind her, hitting Stefan Anderson, causing him to lose balance. She then straddled on top of him and continued to stab him 25 times. 25 times. Now, just think about that. Just um, act out stabbing someone where you were and count as you're doing it. 25, it takes a lot of effort. Like, it's kind of exhausting. You think by, like, the 10th time, it's to be like, you know, I, th I think he's dead, my dear. You know? She then later would have the nerve to testify that she didn't realize she hurt him so badly. You know, I, I, I lost count. Did I stab him three times or 23 times? Fuck it, let's make sure. She didn't know what she had done until she reached out and felt the blood on him. Felt the blood on him as opposed to just looking at him and seeing you putting your stiletto through his eyeballs. I don't know. The fact that he probably wasn't moving could be an indicator. Um, or just the indicator of you stabbing him 25 times in the face. She clearly wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. But the stiletto is. If she had truly been fighting for her life, she would have just ran away as soon as she could. Like, what's the number of stabbing somebody that it stops being self-defense and starts being murder? And there were defensive wounds on his hands and his wrists. Now, her statements with the police, they were often rambling, off-topic, and many times she would just dance around the questions they'd been asking her. And she never showed any tears or any remorse over what she had done. I was afraid if I got off of him, he was going to, I know, nah, I wasn't, I know. He was going to get up and, and he, you know, he was going to hurt me. So I was having him and I was like, please step on, step on, you know. And he was like, ah, ah, I was rowing, like, you know, ah, ah. When she was asked why she continued to stab him when he was clearly not fighting back or not moving at all, she would say, he wouldn't let go of my leg. Okay, so 25 times to the eye. Gotcha. Officers also reported that Anna smelled strongly of alcohol, but for, for whatever reason, her blood level, it, it was never tested. She was arrested directly after giving her statement. Now, her version of events was, um, according to many, possibly including yourselves, was a bunch of mother heckin' BS. Excuse my language. She was clinging to, to the victim cycle of abuse narrative, um, but everybody else would say, hmm, interesting story. I don't think it's true. One old friend, James, he actually had two, two violent run-ins with Anna. Now, she had previously stayed with James, whose place was right across the street from Stefan's. 
James, he lived with his girlfriend Chandra and her young daughter, and Anna had a physical altercation with James' girlfriend Chandra one night. Now, according to Anna, Chandra acted first by throwing Anna down, and then she threw all her things away. No charges were placed for this incident, but that's not all. Another time, Anna returned to James's place drunk after having an argument with Stefan. According to James, they were, they were sitting in his room and he thought she was drunk or something as she was mumbling to herself, giggling, acting very peculiar. He asked her if she was drunk, she didn't say anything. He then said he was sitting in a recliner chair and she came over, you know, seductively like, as if to kiss him. But instead, <laughs> what she did was bite the top of his head. Like, not like a little, you know, nibble, like a love bite or something, no. He said this was violent, like his skin was pulled up and away from his, a full on chomp. Your scalp looks delicious, pal. And she comes over as if she's gonna kiss me and she leans down and she bites me on my head, like violently. And it, like where it pulls the skin away from my head, so. He then told her she had to leave uh, his apartment as in, what the fuck is wrong? Get, get out, get out. He wouldn't have this kind of behavior in his house with his young child there the kind of behavior where she just bites the top of his head, like, not, not, I mean, not in a sexy way even, though I don't know how you could make biting someone's scalp sexy. I mean, hey, when I said I wanted head, that's not exactly what I meant. So, with nowhere else to go, she ran back to Stefan, and this was just days before his murder. There were other examples of violence and just plain old weird behavior from Anna, one of Stefan's friends, who double dated with the couple often, recounted one night that Anna and Stefan had a disagreement at a local taco eatery they frequented, they went to often. During that disagreement, Anna bit Stefan on his face. She was a biter. The staff at the taco place even said, yeah, we had to give him ice to ice the fucking chunk that was taken out of him. There were multiple accounts of unsteady behavior from Anna, but not one account of violence or even raising his voice or getting having a temper from Stefan. Not one person could ever recall him being like that. He was a nice guy, you know, calm, chill, agreeable, who didn't deserve what happened to him. Like stiletto to the eye? Who, who does deserve that? Like, that's a rough way to go. So if anybody does deserve it, it's like Hitler. Stalin, and people who don't indicate when they drive. That's it. End of list. So while Stefan was a nice guy, always chill, Anna, on the other hand, had two previous convictions uh, for her drink driving, at uh, once driving while intoxicated in 2008, and another driving down the highway the wrong way. What? You're going the wrong way! He said we're going the wrong way! Oh, he's drunk! How would he know where we're going? In 2010, she was sentenced to six months in jail when police found her intoxicated and sleeping in her car in a parking lot. So the night of the murder, remember, Anna and Stefan had gone out and had a few drinks, and they came back to the apartment uh, by a taxi. A taxi driver brought them back home. The police questioned that taxi driver, who would have been, you know, one of the last people to, to see them together. Everybody's got an opinion over here. The taxi driver that night had her husband riding along with her as she felt safer, do, you know, doing the late night shifts with her husband beside her. Fair. Well, according to the couple, the taxi driver and her husband, Anna was yelling and insulting Stefan the whole way home. And then telling the taxi driver that she's going the wrong way and he yelled, roared at her, calling her all sorts of shite. Then she got mad and yelled at Stefan for defending. The taxi driver saying, you know, Stefan was just saying, you know, she's just doing her job. Fucking Anna was going red in the face. The driver during her statement with police mentioned that Stefan was polite, very passive, a quiet guy. There was never any hint of anger from him, even when Anna was yelling in his face. Everybody's story was straight, except Anna's. And when the taxi arrived at Stefan's apartment, the taxi driver, concerned from the way Anna was, was being with him, literally asked him, are you going to be okay as Stefan got out of the taxi? He assured her he'd be fine, be grand. That was his last words to anybody except Anna, and he would most certainly not be fine. And if that wasn't enough, even the front concierge at Stefan's apartment had run-ins with Anna. 
Uh, one front desk uh, employee said Anna O always seemed like she was high, she was drunk, she was on so they, they said Anna and Stefan do not make sense. They didn't mesh. And another had warned Stefan about Anna. They had warned him saying, yeah, you got to watch out for her. Um, when in the middle of the night, Anna cut the water line to the fridge because it was, quote, making a noise. Um, no shit, Sherlock. What happens when you're going to cut the water line to the fridge with water still going into the apartment? Water will go everywhere. And they had to make an incident report. If she did that to my fridge... She'd be out the window. So they filed a report, you know, with the people who worked at the apartment building. And in the report, it's written, the employees warned Stefan Anderson about Anna, saying, like, she's a head case if she's doing this shit. But Stefan didn't listen. You never think it will happen to you till it does. So she was an insane person, like severely mentally ill, but she also just sucked. With Anderson for his money, no diggity, no doubt anger issues and I guess one night like an abusive spouse she ended him Anna went on trial in 2014 at the end of the two week trial the jury came back with a verdict after just four hours guilty of murder although her defense was that she was you know, traumatized by years of abuse from previous partners um, it worked against her that she had no proof or police reports of those years of abuse from previous partners the jury also dismissed the idea that Anna acted in the heat of the moment, saying yeah, 25 stabs to the face, that's a bit more than the heat of the moment. You know, that's, that's, you're gone from the heat of the moment to the cool of the moment, and you're still burying your stiletto into his face. She also went on the stand for a, a portion of the trial, reenacting the gruesome murder in front of Stefan's family and friends. That was probably a very poor idea um, on her part, obviously. Hey, this is how I killed him. Let me show you again. Nevertheless, she was sentenced to life in prison. She will be eligible for parole at the age of 75. Who knows? Maybe, you know, when she gets out, she can pick up the, the man-eating lifestyle as a silver dame, you know, a gilf. Good luck to her if she does. Uh, maybe she'll beat her next partner to death with her Zimmer frame. Jackie Swift, Anderson's ex-wife, said it best at the sentencing hearing, that woman is pure evil. Yeah, uh, sounds about right. The cult angle, by the way, I think she just had an interest in it and, you know, just was fascinated by it, as, as I think a lot of people are, including me. But maybe, you know, when, the, when she was going through her tarot cards and the death card came up, she looked at Stefan and said, you know, she did the old, Call an ambulance, but not for me. What the card says goes. Hold on to your stilettos, folks, for the next story is even more batshit bananas. So moving swiftly on, we go from Texas, I don't know why I keep saying it like that, to California to discuss Big D. In the city of Carlsbad, man, the names in this one, though, they're really like, wow, a story of, of crime in Carlsbad. What are you at? Uh, dead giveaways. There, Diana and Greg were going through some turbulent times, as we all do. And so Diana, Big D, decided, um... You know, she she was she kind of thought to herself in her own noodle, and she she was like, I think of I get I can think of a quicker and easier way to get past this you know turbulent time, if only I knew the right guy. She met him. Now, um, give me a second, my friends. Let me just uh, click on this old video. I'm Diana Lovejoy, and quick meals are my specialty. I know that you don't have all day. We've got malice to feed. Welcome to my kitchen, where I really like to cook, but I'm often short on time, so speed is the hook. I'll show you how to make a meal in almost no time flat. It takes less than half an hour, and you'll have it down pat. The recipes from Kraft, who makes fantastic tasty stuff, that's partially prepared, so dinner's not too tough. If you thought this enthusiastic and incredibly natural uh, smooth as silk presenter was headed for the small screen, you would be right, just not in the way that she was hoping. And that is our dear Diana. 
The city of Carlsbad lies to the north of the city of San Diego in Southern California. It's a coastal city, population roughly 100,000. And to be among those 100,000, you'd need to be earning a lot more than that per year. You'd need to be a finger guns rich bitch. It's one of the most expensive, um, sorry, affluent quotation marks, cities in America. If you can't live there, you're just not good enough, sorry. I don't, okay, I actually don't know why I'm speaking so negatively about it. I mean, it's probably, it's a lovely city, and I'm sure the people there are so lovely too. I don't know why I'm just defaulting into, it sucks. Sorry, Carol's Badians, Carol's Bad Lads. Carol's Bad Lads, actually, that's pretty good. It's a beautiful city. Carol's good. And there you got your beaches, your babes, your Legoland, your golf. What more do you want than that? And so, the city of Carol's Bad is where we meet this human, the main character in our story, and her name is Diana Lovejoy. And she really loved joy, but more than that, she loved hate. Hate boner Diana, I like to call her. Passionate about food. My trick is fresh garlic pressed and ginger thinly sliced, sauteed with oil for a minute. Clearly. But not only that, uh, thank God, because I would not trust her with a toaster. She also loved fitness, she loved writing, she loved music, she loved it all. Diana was born in 1975, a native Californian. After attending Mountain View High School, she went on to the University of California, San Diego, graduating with a BA, BA in Literature, Music, Psychology, and Les Français, mon ami. Her career would be mainly centered on technical writing, um, you know, engineering, documentation, data protection, installation guides. You know when you buy pretty much anything, uh, those forms you get, uh, the forms that you get that you never read have to be written by someone, and that someone was Diana. So, Diana, thank you for your exceptional work on some bullshit I'm never gonna read ever and try out just immediately. She started out uh, at Nokia, and then she went on to work for a number of digital companies before landing at Salesforce in 2014 as a senior technical writer, where she would, quote, Welcome the opportunity to make your documentation exceptionally effective. Yeah, great stuff. Thanks, Diana. So, technical writing, it paid the bills. But it was not, no, 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 her passion. I mean, I know, technical documents, lads. It's so, it's interesting stuff. But no, her real passion, fitness. That's when she wasn't making shitty cooking YouTube videos. She would in 2008, become a personal trainer and triathlon coach. She would also write for the Women's Triathlon Organization. Now, to quote Diana herself, she, you know, what, what she was all about was balancing the cerebral with the physical is a lifestyle for me. Now, I don't know her at all, but that really um, sounds like something she would say. My God, balance this, pal. I think anybody who would write that is just so full of shit. So, during these um, exciting times for Big D, that is when she met Greg Mulvihill, who worked in the tech industry. He was a, a software engineer. They met on a dating site in 2005 and seemed like a great match from the get-go. They both worked in the tech industry, they both loved fitness and the outdoors, and they met at an age when you're, you're kind of looking to start settling down, maybe start a family. In August 2007, they married, and that is when they moved to Carlsbad together, buying, buying a home there. This was followed five years later by the birth of their first child. Now, this came with great difficulty for Diana. She had, she'd had eight, eight miscarriages before then, so when they had that one kid, it was, you know, their everything. However, when the child was two years old, that is when the marriage started to decay. That's my decay noise. See, Greg, he, he lost his job, and Diana, she became the sole winner of bread. But she herself had her own, um, her own physical issues. She thought she may have fibromyalgia, which can be quite painful. Essentially, it's just horrendous pain all over your body, a lot of times just for no reason, and it's, it can be very hard, it can be exhausting and very hard to treat. Um, it's also very hard to diagnose, so that can be extremely frustrating, you know, when you're trying to find out why am I in constant agony and no one knows why and therefore no one can tell me what to do. And she thought her, her young son might have it too. So she was, you know, it was, this was a, a turbulent time, as I said at the top. 
In 2014, Diana and Greg, after going through marriage counseling, they separated. Though they, they remained married, um, they just didn't live together, and they, they co-parented their, their son. Now, uh, big booty time, my friends, because what I just said, it's a very nice way of saying what actually happened. What I just said was the way they might explain it if they were asked. In 2014, Greg, he returned home one day with their son, and he was served a temporary restraining order by the sheriff. He had 10 minutes, get into the house, pack up your shit, and get the hell out. Diana, she alleged that she had woken up in the middle of the night two days prior to find him sexually assaulting her, and she wanted him gone. She also said he was abusing drugs uh, around the kid and molesting him. The custody battle, it began. Greg, initially, he was only able to see his son 10 hours a week. There were uh, psychological examinations, that sort of thing, drug tests. And Greg, he retorted. He was like, no, Diana is a crazy, she's a nutshell. She's a crazy bitch who would physically and verbally and emotionally attack him regularly. Like, she's making this entire thing up. He would never, you know, sexually assault her or their son. In November 2015, custody was changed to 50-50. No evidence of abuse by Greg on the son was found at all. The divorce was eventually finalized in June of 2016. Diana, though, after it was all said and done, she, she was scared. She was worried. She was fearful. She was all the other synonyms for scared. She was fearful that, you know, the police, they hadn't listened to her. You know, she had gotten a temporary restraining order, but Greg, you know, he was out to get her. They hadn't, they hadn't believed her when she was saying all these things. She was worried, you know, that Greg would be out to get her. So... What Diana began to do was visit a shooting range on the reg called Iron Sights. She was looking to become a marksman, a crack shot, and she wanted to know how to defend herself in case Greg the Molester came back. She got herself a trainer, a former Marine named Weldon McDavid. Okay, today I'm going to teach the five minute shooting lesson made famous here at the shooting range I work at. First thing, uh, they're shooting on the other side, so, okay, as promised, I said I was going to talk about how to line up your sight. And again, first thing I'm going to do, verify the firearms on the They would communicate constantly, and, and Weldon, well, you know, she was telling all of this whole story to Weldon, and he was a big, big guy who was very, you know, wanted everybody to be safe and was caring. And he wanted to take care of her, Semper Fi. He believed that Greg could be a threat to her and her child. And so he, you know, he became, he eventually became her protector. And then Greg was shot in September 2016. On the 1st of September, on a dark and moonless night, this 911 call came in to dispatchers. Hello, this is 911. Yeah. Hi, uh, my friend has just been shot. Do you know who shot him? There's a guy lying down like a sniper. A sniper? Did you see him at all? Briefly, we saw the, the gun, and he shot at us like six or seven times. Holy moly, there was a goddamn maniac on the loose. The caller was Jason Kovach, and he was telling the operators that it was his friend and co-worker, Greg, that had been gunned down. When officers arrived on the scene, a dirt trail near a reserve on the southeastern side of town where the mountains begin, that's where they found Greg in a vehicle, and he was bleeding out. He had been shot in the chest, the bullet passing right through him. He was rushed to the nearest hospital, and armed police then descended on the dirt trail just off Avenida Soledad. You know, they were walking through this brush, but they didn't find the guy though, this, this, uh, this sniper who had shot Greg. He had escaped into the darkness that night. 
So yeah, <laughs> wow, what are you, what's going on? A weird situation, right guys? And I mean, I have, okay, I haven't even gotten to the weird part yet. Just trust me. So what was Greg and this Jason guy doing out there that night in that remote area? Well, I hear you barking big dog, let me tell ya. See, Greg had already rang 911 earlier that same night. He had called, saying he needed their help. See, a mysterious person, again, earlier that night, had called Greg, someone claiming to be a private investigator, telling Greg he had been hired by Diana. This private eye told Greg he had documents proving he had been abusing his son, documents that Diana would use against him to get full custody of their kid and maybe even some time behind bars for old Greggy. Now, Greg, he was obviously like, um, what the shit? I haven't been touching my son or her or anybody at all. What are you on about? The PI then said, I'll call you back. He did call back, this time saying he had left the documents near Greg's house in Carlsbad, taped to a power pole just off a dirt path on Avenida Soledad in that reserve. So after getting these calls from this PI, Greg called the cops and he was like, okay, somebody is phoning me, saying they have proof of things I didn't do. What should I do? The dispatcher was um, uh, less than helpful, just being like, oh, fuck, I don't know. Do what you want to do. I don't give a shit. So Greg then called Jason and asked him to go to go with him. You know, Jason lived in the same building and they worked together. So at about 11 p.m., armed with a flashlight, Greg and Jason started plodding down that dark trail. And as they approached the pole, this mysterious caller mentioned, Greg, he saw something at the base of this pole. It looked like some rags at the base of the pole, but there was nothing taped to the pole, which is what the guy said he was going to do. So, so starting to feel hinky, suspicious, like this was either a prank caller or some kind of setup. They, they didn't go too close to it. They kept their distance and were looking around in the dark of the night, checking their surroundings. Then, further beyond the pole, he saw... In the darkness, lit only by a flashlight, clothing, and then a barrel. Someone was hiding in the bushes, pointing a rifle right at him. They opened fire. Greg and Jason, they booked it. They booked it out of there, but as they were running, Greg was shot. One hit out of the six shots that whizzed by. They made it back to Greg's car, and then he lost consciousness, and then... There's a guy lying down like a sniper. So the police were on the trail that night, but they found nothing. There was a towel at the base of the pole, though, and underneath the towel was, um... Uh, well, underneath the towel was... Shit. Human shit. It's a nice little surprise there. Though other than that, they didn't find really anything at all. Now, Greg very, very nearly died. The bullet passed under his left armpit, which is where, you know, kind of all your good shit is. But uh, miraculously, you know, he survived. He survived surgery. He was in the hospital for two days before being released. So the investigation into who this was, who was this, you know, attempted murderer, attempt a sniper? Well, you know, all roads led to Diana at first, as you can imagine. But they didn't think she would do it. She's not exactly the sniper wolf you know, type, type character. And when she was questioned, she had no clues as to who would. Man, who would try and kill the husband who had just been making up all these kind of accusations about? Pfft, don't know, beats me. The mysterious caller that night, the PI. Well, that number was traced to a burner phone. So they couldn't, you know, link that phone to anybody in particular, but they could tell where the burner phone had been bought a Best Buy a couple of miles away, and CCTV revealed it had been bought by one Diana Lovejoy just two weeks before the shooting. She was then taken in and placed under arrest. <laughs> uh, give, giving what is a hilarious, hilarious mugshot. I wish you guys could see it. If you're at a computer on your phone, just Google Diana Lovejoy mugshot right now. It's it's gas. You know, Diana, she she's a pretty woman, blonde hair, think everything I said about her, the type of person she is, she looks 
probably exactly like you would imagine. But her expression in this photo, it's its so funny. It looks like someone told her they ate the last of the cake and it ruined her day. Hmm. I doubt she eats cake or does anything fun though. But Diana, she denied having anything to do with it. But someone volunteered to help me with my husband. Now, I don't know if he did anything. I mean, maybe he did. He did say he was going to scare, scare him, but I don't know. She said she had met with Weldon that night, gave him the burner phone, and dropped him near Greg's house. She said, don't know what he did after that, but he said he would call me. Then a little while later, she drove back and Weldon jumped into the car, saying it had all gone horribly wrong and I just had to open up on him. You know, couldn't be helped. Also, that smell of shit, don't worry about it. On the 8th of September, SWAT busted open the door of Weldon McDavid, searching his house. They found, ah, uh, well, a shitload of guns, a suppressor, illegal in California, and spent shell casings. Weldon was arrested. Then, remember that big old pile of shit found at the scene under the pole? DNA testing revealed that, well, yeah, when you gotta go, you gotta go. I mean, maybe he was so nervous about what he was gonna do, which was try to murder Greg, that he just, you know, he was he was literally shitting himself, and so he decided to go in the park. But it, that's it's kind of weird for me, you know, from a Marine. Um, you know, you think they that he wouldn't have been nervous having been in combat situations before. Uh, there you go, though, I, go, I, I guess. <laughs> More like Semper Pi, am I right? It was then that it finally dawned on Weldon that Diana had fabricated everything about Greg. This was like a, an eye-opening moment for Weldon, because he had believed everything Diana said. But Greg wasn't on drugs. Greg didn't abuse her or uh, their child. Diana just wanted him gone. She then met Weldon. She knew he was he was a noble guy who would take you know matters into his own hands if necessary, and she made it necessary. You know, by telling this guy, this guy Weldon, who only saw in black and white, good guys versus bad guys, what he needed to hear. Greg was a bad guy, a molester, a rapist, and he needed to get got. Go get. She also uh she also slept with Weldon though, I guess which would help. That's kind of a just, you know. To, to be sure, you know, if you want to be sure, to be sure. Diana and Weldon were both charged with attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder. It was over a year after the shooting in October 2017 that Diana Lovejoy and Weldon McDavid both would go on trial. Things didn't look too good for them. It would have been like a bam slam dunk, really, but the defense went with what Diana went with. That Greg was a bastard man. And so, you know, listen, lads. This is Wild West out here. Vigilante justice. You guys never listened to, to Diana in the first place? Well, you should have listened to her. You know, and he got what he had come to him. Though, surprisingly at the trial, Diana's aunt testified. Her name was also Diana. And she told the jury that over a year before the shooting, in March 2015, that while out dining at a restaurant, Diana, the younger, had asked uh, her aunt, yeah, you, just a um, random question, you know, totally random, you uh, wouldn't happen to know anyone who would murder for me, do you? Probably in the same manner she might ask, where's the best place to get hot sauce around here? Then, in the middle of this busy restaurant, she's asking for a killer, Randomly, a deputy district attorney just so happened to be in that same restaurant with an earshot that very evening and heard the whole thing. Aunt Diana was soon contacted by the police, but she denied everything. She obviously wanted to protect her niece. No, she never asked me, you know, for an assassin. But I guess when her niece actually tried to go through with it, she was like, oh, okay, maybe I should actually um, mention that. And Auntie Diana had been fed the same shit Weldon had. That Greg, he, he was an abuser and he needed to go. Both Weldon and Diana said there was no... <laughs> Come on, we were just playing around. It's, it's a joke. Duh, there was no intent to murder. You know, things just got out of hand, you know. These things happen, you know. Boys will be boys. After all, listen up. Weldon was in the Marines. He worked at a gun range. He was an expert marksman. If Weldon wanted to kill Greg... He could have killed Greg. Yeah, right. I think Weldon just didn't expect Greg to bring Jason along that very night. I, I, if Greg went up there alone, he probably would have been killed. 
Diana, she wanted her child. And not only that, as part of the custody agreement, she had to pay Greg child support and a lump sum of $120,000. Diana thought to herself, I'll just pay Weldon $2,000 to kill him. That's a, hey, save a bit of money. After a half day of deliberation, the jury returned with its verdict. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Diana Jean Lovejoy, guilty as charged in count one. Verdict. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Diana Jean Lovejoy, guilty of the crime of a attempted murder of Greg Mulvihill. And then something kind of dramatic happened. Guilty of the crime of conspiracy to commit murder. All right, we're going to need to take a break. Diana was found guilty on all charges, but she just wasn't having any of that. She was like, I'm out of here. See you later. Uh, good, literally, Google YouTube this video, because when Diana heard the verdict, she's sitting down and she literally faints. I'm not sure. It's, it's actually, it's, it's not kind of funny. It's very funny. She just straight up collapses in her chair. And if only she put as much effort into her cooking videos. Diana was ultimately sentenced to 26 years to life in prison. Weldon was sentenced to 50 years to life. Diana will be eligible for parole when she is 70 years old. Weldon, when he is 100. And there you have it. That is the end of that chapter. Those two chapters, bizarre, scary, stupid, and uh, kind of funny in parts. Well, especially the second one, because nobody actually died. Whereas in the first one, a guy got a stiletto to the eye. So, yeah, yikes. Well, I hope you enjoyed this old podcast, my friends. Uh, I... You know, you'll hear from me in a couple of days. As I said, uh, please rate, review, like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. It helps out tremendously, and I can't thank you enough. I never will be able to. Also, if you'd like to see some more chapters, go on YouTube. Check out the YouTube channel where I'm always doing crazy cases. The Diana Lovejoy case I made in a video a couple of years back, so you can check that out and see what all the footage and everything I was talking about. But until the next podcast, which will be, you know, probably in like a couple of days, Please take care of each other, take care of yourselves, because I love you. Mike out.